Right, is my microphone on? Yes, sounds good. Okay, hello everyone. I need to make my notes bigger because I can't read. There we go. All right, uh, so my name is James Sickham, um, and I've been doing PHP since about 2002, uh, Zen Certified Engineer, um, and uh, I was uh, one of the guinea pigs for the new uh, ZC test, which was kind of fun. Um, and uh, that's now available, so you can all go and get that. Uh, I'm not a shill for Zen, by the way. Um, <laughs> Um, I run the PHP Hampshire user group and also the PHP South Coast Conference. Tickets now available. Um, and I contribute to various open source projects, Zen Framework, Doctrine, uh, and lead developer on a couple as well. And my day job, um, I'm a consultant at Rove, um, who are purveyors of fine elephants, uh, but we haven't got them done yet, so that's just the prototype. Anyway, enough about me. Uh, so what's Zend Expressive, right? We are here to find out about Zend Expressive and Doctrine. Um, so I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, and this is kind of what's going on underneath uh, uh, an application in Expressive. It's kind of a lot of things uh, here, but I'm going to break it down and look through it bit by bit. First up, PSR 7. Um, Hopefully many of us have now heard of FIG um, and uh, their efforts to standardize things. Uh, PSR 7 is one of those, and um, it is basically modeling HTTP messages, right? Uh, and it's just a set of interfaces. There's nothing complex about this. Um, and you know, HTTP messages are the foundation of the web, right? We've seen them before. You've got the verb requested a page, HTTP version, and so on, uh, the, the host, and maybe a payload, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, and uh, the response is pretty similar, right? We've seen these. This is not uh, complex stuff. And PSR7 models those in a way that you can use uh, in your applications as objects, right? Um, so the next, the first layer of Zend Expressive, uh, its actual implementation, is uh, this package called Directorus. Directorus is um, a silly sounding name. <laughs> it's Greek, and it means messenger. Uh, so that kind of makes sense, I think. Um, it's just an implementation of PSR7. So it takes those interfaces, implements them. Um, it allows you to modify them in an, enum in, in an immutable way. And what that means is that you're never mutating the same instance. You're getting a new instance back every time you say, oh, with added header and things like that. And there's benefits to that. But I'm not going to go into that, because uh, it's not so relevant for this talk. Uh, Directors also handles serialization and deserialization of requests. So you can take a, just a, a, a string, like, like I had on the slides a minute ago, and it will turn it into an object, or do the same the other way. It also handles the core stream handling stuff. So the body of uh, your payload, whether it's request or response, is a stream. So that's kind of defies the immutability thing. But again, that's a, uh, a different argument. Um, we also have a URI implementation. Uh, so I believe there's actually a PSR in progress to do that separately. But for now, Directorus has one, which is kind of useful. And you also have the very basic ability to dispatch a request to a callable. Similar to kind of what you might have seen with uh, uh, Node HTTP server, if you've done Node.js before. Um, and really, it's not so useful. <laughs> it doesn't do very much. And also, the execution model of PHP is fundamentally different, right? Uh, it's shared nothing on a server API. Uh, Node.js is very much different. It's a you know you're building an actual server that uh, that listens. Anyway, Stratagility is the next layer. Um, it's another silly sounding name. Uh, clearly, Zend love the name App Agility a lot, so use that uh, kind of uh, uh, theme. But I don't know why they didn't stick with it with Directorus. Messagility, maybe I don't know. Um, anyway, this is uh, a uh, library for creating and dispatching middleware pipelines. It's built to rely on the PSR7 implementation, naturally. Um, and in theory, 
I guess any kind of PSR7 implementation would work, but you know, we're going to use Directorus um, for this. So what's middleware then, right? Um, for those of you who are like, well, what are you talking about, James? What's this middleware thing? It's um, basically a, an invocable class, right? Uh, this is um, modeled on, uh, there is another PSR uh, that uh, defines how middlewares should look, their function signatures and what they return and so on. Um, so previously you may have seen, uh, for example, in Slim Framework or um, you know, in, in kind of middleware patterns, if you like, uh, it would take a re uh, request and a response and so on, uh, and a next middleware to be executed. Uh, in this one, we have just the request and the delegate interface. That is basically the next thing to be executed. Um, so the way this works, right, we have some code that may happen before, um, something else happens. And then we have delegate process, which is calling the next middleware in the chain. And then you can have some code after, potentially, and then return a response. Right? It's fairly straightforward, and it's kind of nice and atomic. And that's kind of the point of middlewares, is that you can do small atomic operations and chain them all together uh, into this big line of stuff that happens. So. As I said, this structure is uh, based on this, uh, this package, HTTP interop. I can't even talk today, which is no good because I'm up here meant, meant to be speaking to you. Um, HTTP middleware. And uh, it's a work in progress, so actually it's slightly different. The implementation that we have so far is slightly different from the PSR, but I'm sure in time that will be sorted out. Um, and expressive, Zen Expressive 1.1 sort of encourages using this new uh, request and uh, a delegate uh, uh, function signature. And yeah, if you've used middleware before, obviously you get the response uh, in the function signature. Um, but there is a fundamental problem with that. If you modify the response before uh, something else creates a response, then you're going to get unexpected behavior. Because the next middleware down the chain might return a completely new response. So the mutation that you've made to the response coming in is lost. It's gone now. Um, so that's why we have this delegate interface uh, and no request in the function signature anymore. So what if you do want to do it? Uh, if you want to modify something? Well, like I have here, uh, you modify it on the way out because then it will be passed back up the chain correctly. Um, and if any of you read Terry Pratchett, you'll know what a clax is. So this is how we could, um, in a very basic way, pipe up a load of middleware. Uh, in uh, using Stratagility, we can just say, well, pipe, that's basically just add to the pipe um, a load of middleware that do various things. And the middleware pipe, when you run it, uh, I've missed out a run call on this slide, but it doesn't matter. Um, when you run this, it will descend through each one. And strategy, the strategy middleware pipe will take care of um, the, the delegate interface, and it will uh, run the next one in the chain, and so on. And you would uh, descend through in order um, uh, that you add them. So let's have a look at what these might look like. Uh, logging errors is kind of nice. Um, so we could uh, wrap everything below in a try catch and catch everything, for example. And so uh, when we call delegate process, obviously we're ret returning the response directly. But if an exception happens further down the chain, we catch it and we return a JSON response, for example. Session initializing middleware. It's kind of fairly self explanatory. We call session start. And that's what I mean. You, see, you can do lots of atomic operations uh, that are meaningful, and you can name the middleware appropriately. You know, it's initializing the session, right? And it's very clear what this thing does. Authentication, perhaps. Uh, do some authentication checking, or whatever you're doing. Uh, if it's invalid, you can return a JSON response. And the nice thing there is the pipe of middleware is cut off then. Because you're not calling delegate process. So you're not going any further down the chain. You just return back up with your response. And that's great. Per authentication is a perfect example of uh, 
uh, short-circuiting that logic. And then, of course, you might have an action, an index action or something like that, where you might want to render a template or uh, perform some kind of action. Um, and it's in the same kind of uh, structure as we've seen, but in this case, we're not calling delegate, because this is the end of the chain. Um, and we're returning a response directly there. Think of it as like a controller in an MVC framework, if you're used to that. So, expressive itself. One ring to bring them all in, in the darkness, bind them. Uh, expressive is kind of actually just a glue that sticks all this stuff together with a few extra nice stuff. So it uses the PSR7 implementation, it uses the middleware pipes from Stratagility, and it also adds in the routing layer, um, so you can route your requests to appropriate middlewares. Um, you can create services in your dependency injection container um, and dispatch the, uh, the middlewares. You can optionally uh, uh, handle templating and error handling as well. So routing uh, is uh, kind of nice. The way this works is you just pick whichever one you like. So you could use Aura Router, uh, Nikita Popov's Fast Router, or Zen Framework's MVC Router, um, Zen Router. My personal preference is Fast Router because it's fast, as the name may suggest. Um, and it's a very nice little router, actually, um, designed to be fast. Dependency injection container, anything that implements container interop will work. Um, out of the box, you could use uh, Zen Service Manager, Aura DI, or Pimple, but anything should work. My personal favorite is Zen Service Manager, because I like making factories all over the place. And optionally templating. It's optional because, well, not all applications need templating, right? If you're writing just an API, well, you don't need any templating, right? Um, you're just returning JSON all the time, or XML, or whatever. So, but if you do want templating, if you want to make a, a, a website, we do that sometimes, right? Uh, several are supported. Zenview, uh, Plates, Twig uh, are supported out the box. My personal favorite is Zenview because I like having to escape things uh, explicitly all the time. Well, there we go. Uh, piping and routing. Um, so, Expressive has two places to plug in middleware. Um, there is the pipe, which we kind of already discussed, but it's basically always on middleware. Um, and that's basically the part that Stratagility handles nicely. And it's the main application lifecycle. It's useful for logging stuff, if we see, as we've seen, error handling, if you like, global authentication, authorization, and things like that. And of course, triggering, routing, and dispatching. And Expressive, in fact, the routing and dispatching steps in an expressive application are also middlewares that you have to explicitly add to the chain. If you're using the skeleton application, which we'll look at mo uh, in a moment, uh, that's already done for you, so you don't have to do that. And routing as well. Obviously, you want to be able to assign middlewares to specific routes um, that perform specific ac actions. And that's useful as well for uh, partial authentication or authorization. So, for example, most of your website is public, for example, but then you have some specific admin panel or something like that. And, of course, running the middleware on specific routes or even HTTP verbs. So, I'm going to step back a moment into Zen Framework 2 and 3, because uh, you might be thinking, well, what about, where does that leave Zen, uh, sorry, Zen Framework? And it's purely an alternative, right? It's a different uh, way of structuring your application, a different paradigm. Zen Framework 2 and 3, if you're not aware, it focuses on sort of a quartet of, of components. So there's the MVC component itself, there's a module manager, which we'll have a look at in a, in a little bit, an event manager, which uh, the whole MVC lifecycle is kind of based around events. Strictly speaking, they're not events. But that, again, that's another topic. Uh, Zen Service Manager as well. So Expressive isn't designed to be a replacement for Zen Framework. It's just an alternative. Um, Zen MVC is still uh, powered by these events and so on. Events, 
Uh, and it's still a viable op uh, option for applications, and it's kind of it's half preference and half like how, how you want to structure your applications and so on. So if you are familiar with Zen Framework and you wanted to get into Expressive, you kind of need a bit of a mind shift as well. So where in a typical MVC application you would do a load of stuff, you can break that up into these small middlewares that do specific things. You don't have to, of course. You can just have one middleware, action middleware, that does everything. But you're kind of not leveraging the power that you have in Expressive there. Expressive doesn't have modules as such. So if you aren't familiar with Zen Framework, uh, you would have a module, and you'd have this file called module.php, and the module manager would load that up, and you have things like configuration, um, and some kind of bootstrap initialization type thing for each module, and it merges all that down into a, a big configuration file because Zen Framework likes arrays a lot, um, and Ex Expressive does as well. So yeah, make sure you like arrays. <laughs> um, and but you have to do this explicitly in Expressive. Um, so you'd think, well. Maybe I can use Zen Framework components in an expressive application, because there's a lot out there. They do various stuff. You know, there's Doctrine module and uh, all kinds of uh, stuff, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, but it's not quite as straightforward. So that the module manager is missing and is probably quite difficult to uh, sort of integrate into an expressive application. So I wouldn't even go there. Um, so there's a caveat. So anything that module.php does you need to do manually outside of just a, a, a configuration. So this is what you might see in a, a Zen Framework app, uh, module. Um, if it's as simple as this, just returning uh, your config array, that's good because you can use this uh, to your benefit. There's these things called config providers, this fairly new com uh, uh, concept in Zen Framework. Uh, and it's basically... Uh, a replacement for that module.config.php thing. Uh, I'm going to use Zenform as an example. And all we do is just move that config uh, uh, returning into a callable object, right? The advantage, of course, hopefully you can see, is that you don't need to specify the path to a config file. You can use autoloading, because we like autoloading. So you can just say, Give me this object that provides configuration and return it, and great. And Zen Framework has started to uh, adopt this for their modules, some of them. Um, and it's very simple stuff, right? Uh, this is just some example of configuration that we would have seen, um, and it's just in a function that we return it, it's broken down nicely. Um, you know, it's not a lot different. Uh, but it's more portable because we can use the autoloader to, to locate this configuration instead. So now if we look at Zen, uh, Zen form, this is what we see. We actually see that the module.php uh, uh, uses that config provider and gets the same benefits. So this module could now work in an expressive application and a Zen framework application. Good. This is how you would use it in a Zen, uh, Zen Expressive application. You just return the array. It's very straightforward. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, as I said, if the module.php does more than that, just the config, then you might need to add some bootstrap code and duplicate that, which is kind of a bit annoying. Anyway, your application. Let's write one. Um, I'm going to show you an application I've built. If you have a laptop open and you like following along, there is some code on GitHub. And what I'm going to do is a very simple application. It's going to be a book library. Um, there's going to be an action to check in things into the library and check out things from the library. So if you'd like to um, uh, follow along and have a look at the source code, please do. I will give you a moment. Okay. Does anyone still need the link? No? Okay, good. All right, so I mentioned earlier uh, this expressive skeleton, which is by far the fastest and the easiest way to get set up. So I did this, right, for the, uh, uh, this talk. Uh, and you use a CLI tool uh, to configure everything. 
It uses the composer installer stuff, so they didn't obviously write it all themselves, which we don't do anymore. Uh, but you can choose the router DI uh, view templating and error handling as well. So you use composer create project, and we'll call it book library. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, it will first ask you if you want to do a minimal installation or not. You probably want to do a full installation uh, because minimal will mean that you don't get very much configured, right? And you have to do everything manually. We don't like doing things manually, right? Um, you'll be asked which router. I opted for fast route because uh, I like fast routing. You'll be asked what container um, uh, implementation to use. I opted for Zen Service Manager because factories for the win. And uh, a templating engine. In this case, um, we make, I'm making an API, so it's just JSON. Um, so I picked none. And finally, it will ask you if you want to install Whoops or not. Um, I didn't for various reasons. Fine. But after we've done this, we have already got an up and running expressive application. Hopefully, you can run, uh, it'll go off and do the composer install. And then you, it even comes with a bundled command composer serve, which kind of times out after a while, which is kind of annoying. But anyway, uh, again, a different topic. Uh, but if you then navigate to localhost 8080 in your browser, you will see some JSON. And that's it. It's, it's as simple as that, right? So we're going to start off and we're going to create some endpoints. Uh, we're going to write our actual application. So we're going to create a book entity. Um, we're going to create an interface for finding the book entity, which we'll go ahead and implement later. Um, and two endpoints, so two actions, one to check in a book, one to check out a book. The book entity is very simple. We're going to keep it very simple. There's just one property. Actually, in the actual implementation, you'll see there's two properties. There's a name as well, because I kind of got fed up of trying to remember UUIDs all the time. Um, and it's got a single property in stock, or uh, Boolean, true or false. So you can only have one book, uh, yeah, yeah, one copy of a book. We keep the, we're keeping the uh, example simple, right? Checkout method. Um, again, there's not a lot here, right? Uh, if it's not in stock, obviously you can't check it out, so we're going to throw uh, an exception. Um, and then if it uh, is in stock, then we can change it to be not in stock. That's as simple as we uh, keep it simple. Check in method does the same, it's just the opposite way around, right? So we, I also wrote an interface, find book by UUID. Um, and we're not going to implement it yet. Um, we're just going to assume that however we implement this later, um, the clue's kind of in the title, it will be with doctrine. Um, but we give it a UID, and it should return us a book entity. And that's all we want, right? So apologies if it's a bit small if you're at the back, but um, this is the action. Um, it implements middleware interface, as we kind of talked about earlier. So we've got the request, the delegate, and it should return a response. Uh, in this case, I've specified a JSON response because we're just dealing with JSON here. Um, most of this is just try catching and returning helpful error messages. Uh, it's kind of a contrived example, but fine. It's fine for demonstrating. The main meat of this function is the invoking the find book by UUID, um, checking it out, if, if we can, obviously. Um, and obviously, if something goes wrong at that point, we can return a useful response. The check-in action is essentially the same, so I'm not going to show that. So we're going to add some ORM, right? Um, we're at the point where we can now implement something with Doctrine and get integrated, right? Um, I'm not going to talk about the ODM. Um, if you're not sure what those are, there's uh, relational database is uses the ORM, hence object relationship mapper, um, and ODM, ob uh, object document mapper. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about the ODM, so you'll see me refer to Entity Manager which we'll talk about in just a moment, rather than document manager or anything separate. So who's not used an ORM before? We've all used it. All right. Good. Who's not used Doctrine ORM? Okay, a few. Okay. So we'll have a look. Basically, this is how Doctrine works. 
very, very high level, because <laughs> um, it's very complicated underneath. Um, the main parts of this is the database abstraction layer, or DBAL, and that, if you're not aware, allows you to talk to lots of different databases. And then on top of that, we have the ORM, which has the entity manager, and that's the main thing we focus on. Your application houses these entities. So we've already created one, we created the book entity. Um, and these are, in Doctrine's world, um, uh, just plain old PHP objects. They don't extend anything. Um, there's nothing complicated to them. Doctrine, through some magical wizardry, uh, will track changes to your entities. Um, and then when you've finished your request, you will flush uh, those changes to the database by using a call to flush, literally. Um, and your application should have ways of finding these things, right? So um, you can call them finders, services, whatever you want to call them, fine. These would use the entity manager to locate uh, entities and populate them. And entity manager deals with hydrating stuff in the database and so on. An example of this, we've already written one, find book by UUID interface. And that's going to use the entity manager eventually. So if you've ever written any Zen framework applications before, you will, uh, and use Doctrine as well, you may be familiar with Doctrine ORM module. So that is Zen framework bindings for Doctrine, funnily enough. Um, well, a question I've been asked before is, why wouldn't you just use Doctrine ORM the package directly? Well, it has advantages in Zen framework world, right? You've got that wiring configuration uh, from the module that PHP, as we kind of looked at earlier. Um, you can have uh, you know, all your services are pre-configured from that configuration. You've got CLI tools already set up, and uh, if you use it, Zen developer toolbar integration and so on. It also has some nice Zen form integration as well, um, and surprisingly reasonable documentation. But that's because it's not part of Zen Framework, right? <laughs> I actually like Zen Framework. It doesn't sound like I do, but... Um, so, can we use this in Expressive, right? Um, yeah, you can. Um, but you obviously run into this problem very quickly that there is no config provider. So we have to write something like this, which is kind of annoying, um, a bunch of code that pulls in the configuration manually. You don't have that advantage of the config being auto-loadable. And you need to manually configure the CLI and things like that. So you could do this. Um, I've submitted a patch to both Doctrine module and Doctrine RM module, because you need both, and you need to pull in the configuration from both. I've submitted patches to get config, config providers in there, but they're sitting there waiting to be merged. Um, so hopefully, eventually, this will become uh, easier and simpler. So why would you use this module? Like I said, Zen, Zen form integration is nice, um, if you like Zen form. Hydrators and things like that. Um, and that makes certain activities easier. But wait, there's more. Um, there is a package called Container Interrupt Doctrine. Uh, it's written by someone called Ben Scholzen. I probably pronounced his name wrong, he's German. So um, it's got an, an umlaut, I think, on the O. Anyway, sidetracked. Um, he's written this component, uh, and it's not actually specific to Expressive. You can use it anywhere you use Container Interrupt, hence the name Container Interrupt Doctrine. And what this does is it allows you to automatically configure Doctrine uh, with factories and things like that. It's just a bunch of factories that automatically configure it. Cool. So Composer require, blah, blah, blah. If you don't already have Doctrine as a dependency, it will add it. And um, in your configuration, I would suggest making a separate configuration file called doctrine.global.php, whatever. That's where your con uh, configuration files go in Expressive. And it's very simple. You just wire up this one factory, and you get Doctrine ready to use. And wherever you have your container, you can pull the entity manager uh, and other things like connections and whatever. And this works fine if you just have the default, it's called ORM, uh, ORM default namespace uh, for connections. It does work with multiple configurations. If you want, check the documentation. Uh, it's written on how to do that. <laughs> 
And there's examples, which is kind of nice. So you obviously, you also need to configure it to point to a database. Um, so uh, also in that configuration file, you would add your database credentials and so on. Um, don't put passwords into Git. Uh, that's bad. Um, I'm using Postgres, but uh, any database should work in theory, right? That's what the database abstraction layer is for. Uh, and there's full examples in Doctrine, con uh, container interrupt Doctrine. Um, yes, obviously don't, uh, oh, don't put that uh, uh, with your actual passwords in there. You can use um, local.php, uh, which is uh, automatically git ignored so that you don't uh, accidentally commit your database credentials or secret keys, whatever. Um, yeah. So if you look at the example application, the book library application on GitHub, um, I've done it the right way there. So the slides are slightly out of sync there, perhaps. CLI config as well, because um, Doctrine is much easier to use if you have these CLI tools that come with it. Um, so there is things like schema generation or the other way around, so you can generate your entities from your existing database. You can uh, plug in Doctrine migra migrations as well, which I'm not covering in this talk. Um, and yeah, they, these CLI tools are very useful. They can validate your uh, schema as well, so you make sure you've written your entities properly and things like that. So you probably want to do that. Uh, it's basically just copy and paste this code. <laughs> it's, that's all I can say, really. It's, uh, uh, you don't need much more than that. And then you can run uh, vendor bin doctrine, or do yeah, vendor bin doctrine, uh, and you will get those CLI tools, which is very useful. And we'll have a look at using that in a moment as well. So, as I said, entities are just plain old PHP objects. Um, but how does Doctrine actually work with that? Um, you can use these things called annotations. They're just comments with specific syntax. And you might think, well, loading that every time is going to be really slow. It's okay. Doctrine caches those. Um, you can also do these annotations. Well, they're not called annotations then, but you can have your NC configurations as XML, if you like. Um, or YAML if you like pain, but YAML is going away from Doctrine, so you know, maybe maybe don't use YAML. Um, again, a different talk perhaps. <laughs> All right, so this is what an annotation might look like. We have the table name, book in this case, um, and we have an ID column, um, and I'm using UUIDs rather than sort of auto-incrementing primary keys. That's a good practice. Um, Again, there's a whole other talk about that. Um, and the benefits is that you get fewer collisions, you can do distributed systems nicer and things like that. So there is also actually a library uh, from Ben Ramsey who wrote the UUID library that I also use in uh, the book library application uh, that has a specific doctrine type, so it kind of integrates slightly nicer. Um, but I actually haven't used it yet. I apparently like doing things manually. Silly me. Um, but yeah, you have these annotations at ORM backslash on. Uh, and you, there's lots of different options. You can put in caching configurations and um, you know, your foreign key associations in, in the indices and all that kind of stuff. So anything you can do in a normal database, you can chuck into these annotations. Um, documentation is reasonably good for this, so do check it out if you're not sure what's going on. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, I already explained the IDs, that's fine. Um, so let's go ahead and implement this. Um, we're going to call it Doctrine Find Book by UUID, and that's the implementation of the interface we wrote um, earlier on. It's very straightforward, really. Um, the class constructor, if you've got the code open, you'll be able to see that uh, in this file. Uh, it takes an object repository. Uh, doctrine, that's something that is, we configured earlier with the factory, uh, and we just call the find method. Uh, we cast our UUID to a string, because um, I believe it casts it to a string anyway, but I like being explicit. And if we don't find it, Doctrine will return null by default, um, so I turned this into a noisy exception. Because our interface mandated that if you can't find a book, we throw an exception. 
All right. So the checkout action, we can update those. And I'm calling this funny little function called transactional. This is kind of pointless for this specific use case, but it's a good example of doing transactions with doctrine. So that's why I put it in there. So it's kind of an academic example. But it's nice because you can have atomic operations. Um, so multiple queries may happen uh, that depend on other things. And if something breaks, doctrine will roll that back. So you begin, it begins the transaction in the database. You, it runs the callable that you provided. In this case, this just calls the one function. And then you call flush at the end, or it calls flush at the end, rather. And as I said, if there's any exception or anything, it will roll back in the database. In real terms, all we're doing here is taking advantage of the automatic <laughs> flushing um, for this case. Um, but it's a very practical example. The atomicity uh, may be necessary for your application. You know, if you want to create a user and take payment or the payment fails, you, know, you might want to roll things back uh, and deal with that in a specific way. Um, what is it good? Yeah, try and get in the habit of making properly dem demarcated transaction. Um, I don't know how you pronounce that word. Sounds right to me. Anyway. Generate the schema. So obviously we handily configured the CLI tool. Um, so we can run this command ORM schema tool create. And that will examine the entities and the annotations that you've given it and automatically create your database for you, which is pretty cool. Don't run it in production, though, <laughs> because it may nuke your database. Uh, these are just development tools, right? And then we can insert some data. Pretty self-explanatory. We need a book that we can check in and out. Um, and then now when we visit our URL, you should see the JSON response. You should see you've checked out the great escape. And similarly, if you check in, you should see what well, you checked in them. And then if you try and do check in twice or check out twice, then you'll see an exception on the second time and so on. And hopefully everything is working. Excellent. So let's pretend we didn't put a transaction in there. Um, flushing is a key part of the ORM process. Because if you don't call flush on the entity manager, nothing in your database changes. So the way Doctrine, as I mentioned earlier, Doctrine tracks, tracks changes to your entities. And it stores them up in this thing called a unit of work. And it's kind of like a to-do list of what do I want to do in the database um, that Doctrine uh, builds up as you change things. Um, and then when you call flush, it will analyze all the changes that have been made and execute them into the database. So just as an academic example, let's write a middleware that does this flush at the end of a request, for example. It's not actually useful in our case because we already call transactional, but anyway. So things are pretty straightforward here. Um, I want to po uh, point out that we're using the old style of middleware, so with the request and the response. And I've done that on purpose, so I can show you what it looks like. Um, but we need a next thing to call. So we have to make sure that it's there. And this is kind of a good practice. You know, If we need to call it, we need to make sure it's there. In most cases, it will be if you've configured it properly. But if you forgot to configure the, uh, uh, the middleware pipe correctly or screwed something up, then this will be useful for you. you know, so it's kind of saving yourself pain later down the line. Make sure that it's piped correctly. Um, and of course, that's kind of endemic because you can provide null as that parameter, which makes sense sometimes, but so we check. Um, this middleware doesn't return its own response. Um, so we just return the response that we get from out uh, or the next middleware, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, after that, uh, yeah, we, so, so we call the me next middleware. Um, and then we check if the entity manager is open. So if something breaks or an exception is thrown, database exception and so on, um, the entity manager becomes closed. And that basically means you need to clean up uh, the request, don't do any more database operations. Um, yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. Anyway, um, so we call flush, essentially. Um, 
and that will save the changes to the database. And then we can return the response that we got from uh, the callable. And of course, this is kind of the fundamental part of the middleware structure. We are uh, calling the next thing, and it goes down the middleware chain, and then this happens after everything else has happened. Hence why we've put the code after the call to out. So we've got a good functioning application now, which is kind of nice. So far, we've set up Expressive with the skeleton application. That was super quick. Um, we've created endpoints to check in and out the book. Uh, and we've added doctrine integration. Cool. We can do more stuff, though. Authentication. Let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. So normally, with an API, you probably want to do something like OAuth or some kind of token system, probably just OAuth. Um, but we're going to keep this API super secure with a magic query string. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't do this in the real world. But uh, yeah. So the actual authentication is very simple. If we've got uh, authenticated equals one in the query string, great. Let them in. Um, and uh, we can catch that failure and return back up the chain very quickly. We can short circuit that middleware pipeline because we've not executed next. So we're coming straight out uh, of the pipeline there because authentication failed. Um, and if we do pass the authentication, we can execute the next middleware. Again, this is the old style. It's, I mean, it's still current, the current style of middlewares with the request and response and so on. But don't change the response beforehand because you'll get that unexpected behavior that I discussed. So um, a nice option here is to use a library again from Ben Scholes or Dasprid, uh, this is uh, internet name thing. Um, a nice option here is to use a library called Helios. Uh, and that uses uh, JWT, which if you were in the talk just uh, before mine, uh, you will have learned all about JWTs. Uh, but for those of you who weren't, um, it's JSON Web Tokens. And it's kind of this stateless um, uh, storage. And you can um, store it without server-side sessions. So it stores it in this token, this JWT, which is signed and things like that. And you can pass it down in a cookie and things like that. So you don't have to use sessions. But again, that's a separate talk as well. Um, and Helios implements uh, authentication via these middlewares, right? Um, you register an identity lookup interface, which, as you might have guessed, it will look up an identity or user, whatever you want to call it. For example, you can pull it from a doctrine repository and return it. Then you register your identity middleware into your pipeline, so you add that into your configuration, and that will inject uh, uh, the authentication user into the request which is kind of nice. And we'll, uh, we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. And then, obviously, you need to implement your sign-in, sign-out actions if you're doing, uh, you know, if you need a log-in, log-out type thing. Uh, and you can use the cookie manager to inject and expire authentication and so on. Obviously, the JWT stuff may be not so useful for uh, API stuff, because APIs don't usually use cookies, <laughs> hopefully. Um, there's also another library called PSR7 Session, uh, which uses these JWTs to store your session data in cookies. Um, it's HTTPS only by default. You can actually override it, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Um, and again, it provides another middleware, which you add into your middleware pipe. And it adds this session container into your request. So after every middleware later on, you can then access this session container uh, and it does all the stuff for you, which is kind of nice. So I'm going to, uh, if you've got the code, you may have already noticed this, but I'm going to use this um, to add a counter into our responses, which is kind of pointless for an API, but hey, and it relies on cookies. Um, anyway. So factory, the middleware, there's lots of code here. Um, it basically, I copy and pasted it, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, there is a symmetric key written in there, um, but don't hard code that. <laughs> Put it into your local.php, like I kind of explained earlier. Um, 
because you want to be able to hide that away and not put that in Git because that's bad. Also note that I've uh, here with secure is false. I've done that on purpose because I'm running this on PHP's built-in server, um, which is not HTTPS. And without that, it won't work. It will say, well, you're not on HTTPS. So good luck. So as I said, we add the, the middleware into our pipe. So this is our application's pipe configuration. Um, and you'll see that there's a routing middleware, dispatch middleware. Those are provided by Expressive, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've got a URL helper and some authentication. But here, we've added our session middleware. So everything after that middleware has executed will then have access to this session container, which has been chucked into the request attributes. And this is how we use it. So in uh, a further app, uh, a middleware further down, we can say request get attribute, and it's got this constant that uh, refers to the key that is in the attributes. We can get that session container. We can call set, get, remove, and so on. And that's very useful. Right. So, to summarize, um, why do I do bullet points like this? It's kind of annoying. Anyway, uh, PSL7 is really what kicked off all this stuff, and it's really useful um, to be able to model that, uh, you know, your requests and responses and so on. Deactorus is just a PSL7 implementation, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the only complex thing really is the serialization and deserialization of these requests. Strategility is a middleware pipeline thing. You can use this independently. You know, you don't have to use the whole expressive thing. Um, if you just want uh, the middleware component, it's actually kind of useful. Expressive glues it all together. It has your routing, your DI, and whatnot. Doctrine module can be used with that bit of, bit of fiddling, hopefully that will become easier once we have the config providers in there. Um, so I would probably say in most use cases use container interop doctrine because it's easier. We like easy things. And middleware all the things, right? There's lots of packages popping up. Um, uh, if you search packagist for middleware, you'll probably get loads and loads of results already. Because um, lots of people are doing things and then uh, th doing things with middlewares, and as I kind of mentioned, getting those nice atomic operations is nice because you can actually then go and share these middlewares and avoid having to write the same code over and over again. So, like using PSR seven session or uh, Helios and things like that, you're taking your pain away from yourself by using code that someone else has written. Um, and of course, we thank those people for their time and contributions and so on. Um, okay, is there any, or are there any questions? No? Either I explained that terrifically well, <laughs> or, or uh, I don't know, come and speak to me after if you have uh, any further questions. But thank you very much, folks. Yeah.